by Elif Derios, Katrin, and of course, Nadia for this conversation, where we're going to talk a little bit about our visions for the future of Edry. Um, this vision obviously isn't in a, isn't in a void. Uh, we are thinking about what does digital rights mean in the current world that we live in, a changing world. And to get a little bit depressing for a moment, that, that is a world where we see increasing mass surveillance. Um, we also need to think about who is most affected by those harms that we've talked about and was discussed in the last panel. So we're increasingly seeing sex workers censored on the internet with their livelihoods threatened. We're seeing AI being used increasingly at the border to decide who can pass and send policing and directing in their area. We're seeing increasingly young and particularly racialized people, young boys being put on matrix, on lists, as future criminals. And, and also, when, if we talk about marginalization, marginalization, we're also seeing uh, the rights of marginalized groups or vulnerable communities, vulnerable groups in our society, uh, co-opted um, to, to say that they are being used to preserve our rights. So we're seeing that in terms of the child sexual abuse uh, material regulation, where child rights are being used as a way to, to break our privacy. We're also seeing that very much in the AI Act, where the rights of people with disabilities are being used, especially by big tech lobby, to, to be um, used to justify uh, the development of new invasive technologies threatening uh, various of our rights. So, depressing moment over, we're here to talk about community, but what sort of community would we need to fight all of that? That's what we're, here we're going to talk about today. Before we jump into the conversation, I would like to give a little shout out. A lot of this conversation about community rights, the movement and what should it be, very much um, stems from the decolonizing process that Edry is engaged in with the Digital Freedom Fund. Uh, many of us in the room are involved in that, but I would just like to shout out to Laurence Meyer, who co-leads that project with us over there, <laughs> somewhere over there, <laughs> whose vision and leadership has really taken us through to a challenging, challenging place. Lots of people in this room, Claire Fernandez and also Nani Jansen Revenlo, were in the, in the process of leading that process. And let's also uh, pay homage to the work that, and the, the really long years of work that's gone into that process of thinking about how we as a movement transform. So thank you for that. If you would like to see a little bit about the decolonizing process, go and have a look at Ahmed's exhibition, which is in the other room, and you can uh, see a very exciting video game that we made about this process. So thank you for Ahmed for doing that. Okay, so we're gonna jump in. Um, Elif Derios, you are first, hi. <laughs> we um, would like to talk about, as you are a member of the decolonizing process, we'd like to talk a little bit about, firstly, how you came to that, and what was your process of thinking about how especially the digital rights fields need to gauge, engage with other movements? Um, thank you. Thanks, Sarah. A home of Digitalis is based in, uh, in Greece, and uh, unfortunately, Greece has adopted over the past years a lot of intrusive surveillance technologies in the field of borders and in the, and in the field of migration. Uh, so as Homo Digitalis, of course, with the help of the network, we were trying to investigate related cases uh, with uh, an important but rather limited uh, perspective, the data protection perspective, uh, the lens of privacy and surveillance. Uh, and this, of course, is very important because we speak about, uh, let's say, uh, drones, CCTV cameras, we speak about AI, uh, behavior analytics tools used in the actual uh, premises that host asylum seekers in Greece. We speak about social media monitoring tools uh, that are uh, my, uh, that are like focusing on migrant communities, they are surveilling them, and they try to predict migration flows. And all of these different technologies are important for privacy, but we are feeling that we are missing an important part of the debate, and that we are not expert enough to understand more the risks that arise from the securitization of migration, uh, from the militarization of borders, and the issues that arise from the privatization of borders as well. So joining this process was important for us in order to not only build uh, uh, trust, uh, build together, let's say, new collaborative actions with organizations outside of the digital rights bubble, with social justice organizations to meet them, uh, strategize together and try to do specific actions, but also it was um, an aha moment for us to understand better what we are doing wrong and how we need to revisit these challenges in order to understand better the marginalized communities that are the front for from forefront of these technologies. This was something important for us for joining this process. 
Thank you so much, Eleferios. And Nadia, you're also involved in that process. And you've been doing a lot of work at Bits of Freedom to understand how can you connect with other movements, especially those most impacted by some of the digital harms we're talking about. Can you tell us a little bit about why you think it's important to connect with other movements, um, but also what might be some of the challenges, especially for digital rights organizations doing that? Yeah, well, first of all, congratulations, Edri. Congratulations to everyone. Um, yeah, if you have been around working on digital rights as long as Edri, um, you've made a journey from working on a very niche subject to something that is everywhere. So naturally, the impact and the context of technology and the use of it has shifted tremendously. Um, uh, and also, the people who are impacted by these technologies are often different from the people um, who were interested in the subject we were working on 20 years ago. So I guess one of the challenges we're facing is how are we going to understand the impacts on these communities and people who are affected by technologies uh, but who are not represented in our organizations yet, uh, or at least not enough? Um, how are we going to reach out to these communities, to these people, uh, hear their stories, learn from them, their experiences, um, and include that in our work in a supportive way? Uh, so in the Netherlands, we've had many examples uh, of uh, how technology has gone completely wrong. Uh, especially for certain communities, certain people, often women of color, mothers with a low income. We were already notorious because of the child benefit scandal in which the tax authority uh, wrongfully accused a lot of parents uh, uh, of committing fraud. Um, now, uh, recently, uh, Lighthouse Report has published new research uh, on algorithm use uh, by the municipality of Rotterdam, um, in which, again, women uh, um, of color with a low income were targeted. So this happens over and over again. And we need to make sure, as digital rights organizations, uh, that we stand next to the people who are affected by technology. Thank you, Nadia. Notice next to, not for, on, and not speaking with, and not for people. I love of that. Of course. Thanks. <laughs> um, linked to that, Katrin, we um, have talked a little bit about your work to highlight, okay, there are some areas where we think maybe the digital rights movement could connect better with. And could you tell us about what are some of those issues or movements that you think we could be reaching out to more? Yeah, thanks for that question and also congrats from my side. Um, I think um, what is really, like what I'm thinking about quite a lot is this notion of centering justice in our work as digital rights communities and also as digital rights organizations. And that might also mean that digital rights is just a part of a bigger pie or a part of a layer, um, for example, in democratic systems or um, also, yeah, in fighting for equity. So I think it's also important to acknowledge that um, we have to embed, like we have to make sure that we embed our work in other justice movements. And I've been exploring two of those mo movements a bit more. Um, one, the intersectional feminist movements, um, simply because, yeah, I will repeat it again, tech is affecting different communities in a different way. And we have to have an eye on that and have to make sure that not only the tech, how it is built, is built for everyone, but also um, that we keep these um, perspectives in, in mind when we're advocating for them, for example, on the Brussels um, level. And then the second one is also um, the question around digital rights and the climate justice movement. Because simply if we're working on, I don't know, bias um, in AI, 
like what is happening as well is a climate crisis that we just have to face as a digital rights community as well. Um, and we do have quite a lot of tools that we can use or that we can provide to these communities. For example, countering um, mis and disinformation on climate or also equipping um, digital, um, sorry, climate, activ climate activists and land rights defenders with security tools. So there is quite a lot to do. And um, I would like to shift a bit the perspective from how can we connect to these communities and really question like, how can we embed our work in these communities? How can we support them? And um, how can we not just incorporate them, but really make sure that we make a really good basis that ensures um, human rights in general? Thank you for that. And I think also in addition to that point, thinking about the connection between our work and the climate justice movement, also thinking about the embedded inherent extractivism that comes with all of these technologies that we're talking about. We're not just talking about disproportionate impact of people here, marginalized communities in the global north. We're also talking about what is the cost of these technologies, who develops them, resources and land, as you said, taken from whom, and how do we actually, how would we actually support movements fighting against that too, alongside our fights against mass surveillance or predictive policing or whatever. So thank you for that. Um, our last question for before we end and before we all go party is to think about dreaming and visioning and ending this on a future looking note. I would like to ask our panelists, what are your hopes for this movement in the future? Uh, what is your vision or your wish for the, for the digital rights field? And Elif Derios, I come back to you first. Yes, um, uh, my wish is to remain a place of curiosity, a place of organizations, of uh, activists, of individuals that are not uh, that are not stop questioning all the related technology-led uh, uh, developments that uh, keep making the right questions and keep pushing for change. I think it's important to take a step back and appreciate the curiosity that exists in our field, and I wish for it to exist in the future. Katrin, same question. Yeah, I actually sat today in the morning and made a list of 10 points and then I was like, okay, maybe I should <laughs> shorten all my dreams. But um, just to highlight a few, like I would really like this um, whole community to be accessible in the sense that we open up more to other people. I think it's a very, very important task that we um, still have to do quite a lot on, um, at least speaking from my own experience. Um, and I would also like to have more funding generally. I think that would be really nice. <laughs> cash. <laughs> cash, yeah, we have to speak about cash. Um, and um, finally, I would like to have some moments of reflection. Um, what has not worked maybe? Um, what have we not been so good at? Um, and yeah, I just thought right now with um, the theater before, we need some moments of laughter as well. So yeah, that's my big dream. And Nadia. So we at Bits of Freedom take a lot of inspiration from DFF's slogan, digital rights are human rights. So that also means digital rights organizations should be civil rights organizations. Um, and standing up for human rights has never been a popular thing uh, because it means fighting power structures with, which comes with a lot of counteracts. And that takes a lot of courage and perseverance. So we need to fully recognize and understand that not all lives matter until black lives matter. Um, we need to not only raise our voice when uh, Trump is being silenced by Twitter, uh, but also, when Palestinians are being silenced on Facebook, <laughs> while, while, <laughs> while they're under attack by the occupier. Uh, and we need, 
we need to stand together with mothers who are being targeted and criminalized by their governments while they're raising and protecting their children. So my hope is, my hope is that we will all find the courage uh, to do so, coming from a place of love, uh, love for justice. Thank you very much, all of you. And I can speak on behalf of the person <laughs> continuously clapping to say that was very inf inspirational and moving, and thank you. And nobody asked me, but my uh, vision <laughs> for the future of the digital rights uh, movement is um, also to be political and think about how we can be critical, radical, do radical acts and change things, number one. Also to have some fun. And lastly, to abolish the police. Thank you. Thank you.